At that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Oftentimes, uh, we as human beings uh, get excited about uh, things that are happening around us, and often those things are uh, dealing with uh, leadership. And so if you uh, are a a fan of a particular team, maybe you get excited when a new coach comes. You think, ah, you know, then we'll win the championship. Uh, Or this happens a lot in in uh, uh, political things. This happened in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, and everybody was excited because Germany, who was impoverished um, through, first of all, fighting World War I, uh, but then at the Treaty of Versailles that ended uh, uh, World War I, uh, Germany was charged with paying reparations, and so this impoverished the nation as well, and so that gave rise to Adolf Hitler, who came in and said, We're not the bad guys here, and I'll take you out of uh, economic um, uh, hardship here. Just follow me. And everybody was excited. And Germany was excited for Hitler. They thought, ah, he'll, yeah, we're not bad guys, and and he'll lead us into better economic times. Um, We know that uh, we don't, if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline here in your introduction, that we don't as humans control, humans don't control their own circumstances and well-being. Humans don't control their own circumstances and well-being. This is our condition. Uh, We want to be doing well. Uh, We want our circumstances to be like we want our circumstances to be, but we realize there are lots of things that we can't control. And second line there for you, in our sin natures, in our sin natures, and here's what our sin natures do, they exclude God from the picture. Our sin natures exclude God from the picture. So in our sin natures, which exclude God from the picture, we look to fellow humans to help with our circumstances, to help with our well-being. We look to help, look to fellow humans, and often, as Scripture teaches, to governments, to governments, to control our circumstances and secure our own well-being. So our sin nature is knowing that we can't control our circumstances which bring about our well-being, We exclude God from the picture and we look to fellow humans, authorities, whether they be bosses or coaches or what have you, um, to control our circumstances and secure our own well-being. We can see this with elite athletes. Um, Elite athletes are at this level where the competition is just so great, where everyone's good. You know, if you're a good athlete in high school, you can still stomp on everybody. You know, just these Division I football players in high school, they were just stomping on everybody the year before, right? If you're 300 pounds as a freshman in college playing offensive line, what were you doing to guys last year? <laughs> right? Um, but, we, but we see that they, they, they see their circumstances beyond my control. Um, uh, Right now, or probably it's already happened, the last race in, in F1 racing, Grand Prix racing, that occurred. It occurred in um, Abu Dhabi, I think Saudi Arabia. So it's happened already. I'll find out what happened tomorrow. Um, but the, the last race, and one of these racers that I like, one of these two guys, last year, uh, there are 20 racers in Grand Prix. 
Every race has 20 racers. There are 10 teams, and each team has two, two racers. And this guy that I, that I like, his name's Sergio Perez. Perez, he says, Perez. Um, he's uh, Mexican, and he um, got in a wreck in the first lap, spun around, uh, but his car was okay, so he wound up being in 20th place. And he worked his way up through the field, and he won the race. But the amazing thing about this, not, that he, not only that he went from 20th to first place, which is really difficult, uh, was that he had never won an F, a, a Grand Prix race before at the top level, F1, and he had been in 12 years. He was uh, the one with the uh, bad title or whatever, that he was the longest in F1 without winning a race. And so he wins this race. I was just watching it, the other uh, 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 film of it, um, this, this uh, uh, week. And he's there on the podium and very emotional and crying and, and pointing up to heaven. And, and you see this even with people who aren't particularly religious. They recognize, and all these non-Christians who are athletes who score a touchdown or whatever it is, win a championship, and they point to heaven because they recognize, they know in their souls that God exists and that he arranges all things. This is the image of God coming out in them. Right? They realize... I'm not in control. All these things have to happen right for me to win, whether it's a game or a championship or, or, or whatever. Um, we don't control all the... You can be, it's like, you know, uh, uh, dri driving a motorcycle, riding a motorcycle, sorry. You can tell I haven't ridden one. But I've thought about that through the years, getting a motorcycle, and some of you have too, but you realize that you could be the best motorcycle driver in the world, rider in the world, and it doesn't matter if someone doesn't see you on the road. It just doesn't, doesn't matter. You know, you just, there you are, and you're dead. Um, our circumstances we can't control. Um, common things we do because of this, we, we might be drawn to manipulate people or things to control our circumstances. Um, to lie, um, to maneuver, um, so that our circumstances get changed. And this is what makes great movies and TV, right, and novels. Somebody's lying and maneuvering because they want a certain thing. Um, James talks about this. This is why we don't get along. This is why we slander, uh, to, to get things how we want them, how we want them to be. Uh, but a large one that Scripture speaks about and which Luke was dealing with, because Luke was writing to Theophilus. You see this in chapter 1, verse 3. Theophilus, as we mentioned last week, is called by Luke, Most Excellent Theophilus, which is a title that you gave to Roman governors. That's who was called Most Excellent during uh, the days of the first century. And so Theophilus is a Roman governor. He's probably in Rome. Um, someone that Luke knows through being in Rome with Paul and Paul's first imprisonment that we read about in Acts 28. And so Paul addresses Luke, or Luke, sorry, Luke addresses Theophilus, and he's telling them throughout, telling uh, Theophilus throughout this whole book, Luke, uh, certain things that are true for him or that he needs to realize particularly, uh, being um, probably, uh, I would say, somebody who had converted to the Jewish faith and then heard the gospel and then converted to Christianity as well. Things that are true that Theophilus needs to realize. And one of the things that uh, Luke brings forward is that this, our circumstances, we tend to go for in government. We think if I just have the right government, things will be okay. Okay, and so this is something, you know, the book of Revelation is about this. That, that you know, the, the men, who do they worship? The beast. Government. What does government promise? I will take care of all your needs. Whether that's through giving you excessive freedom, if you're a Republican and a, a, a capitalist, or whether that's controlling what everyone does, if you're a Democrat and more of a socialist. Okay, that's our divide here. But whatever, both groups right, are looking toward government, my governors, to arrange things in a certain way so that my life is good. And this is what we see during an election year. Right? Hopes raised. Maybe the good guys will get in office, or maybe they'll be able to stay in office, and 
more good guys will be able to come around them and then things will be arranged in such a way because they control my circumstances. They control whether my life is good or bad. And this is why we see people weeping on election night at the victory party. Weeping in joy because they think now everything will be okay until they realize it's not. And even parties, both sides, who wind up with, in our country, a president and both houses uh, in, in power, all the things promised don't get done. Um, this is the, the rebuke that Nebuchadnezzar gets, of course. All things are under my control. Um, this is what Daniel talks about in Daniel 7 and Daniel 9, that people think that governments will make them uh, make their circumstances and their, and their lives good. And God says, that's a God, and you need to repent. I am king over all circumstances, and I will make your life good whether you're in a prison, in a country that's persecuting Christians and executing them, or whether you're in a country in which Christianity is prospering and the government's actually encouraging people uh, to be believers. One of the objectives that Luke has for Theophilus is just showing Theophilus that, that Jesus from the get-go, he's the one that is offering prosperity and goodness to people's souls in life. Whether they're despised lowly Jews like Mary and Martha, um, or uh, whether they're high ups like him, Theophilus. Um, government is not the answer. People are not the answer to arranging circumstances in our lives so that our lives are good. Um, this is the uh, reason we have news channels 24 hours a day. Right, when CNN came out, you know, if you're old enough, people said, what are they going to talk about for 24 hours a day? And now we know how destructive that is because they follow these little things that don't matter. <laughs> and that's the talking point until something else comes up and then the, the, that's completely dropped, the first thing. It's why um, uh, talk radio is so popular. Um, it's because it, we think somehow that our knowing something is going to change the world. <laughs> I want you to get that. As your pastor, I want you to get that. If you know what's going on in Congress, it's not going to change anything. Right? We gotta be honest about that. Um, but God changes things. That's what we believe. That's, that's why we're people of, of hope. We're not trusting in men. As David says, we're not trusting horses or, or chariots or princes. We trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Um, so whether you've got a boss above you, don't trust in him. Uh, whether you've got a coach above you, don't trust in her or him. I should say her the other way too. That's always generic. Don't worry about that. Um, or whether it's a government or whether it's your parents um, and you're a kid living in the house, God arranges circumstances. And we all know in our lives that there are things where there was no hope for things changing and then things just change on a dime. And that's God at work, our sovereign king, king of the universe, king over the church, working things out for us. So Daniel and Revelation tell us this is so, don't trust in human beings, don't trust in governments to take care of healing your every, every malady, physically, socially, and financially. Rome was no different. They were promising the same. Uh, they were making people bow down. Nero was bowing, bow down to them, to the government, um, and, and uh, promising, just be faithful to us, and we'll provide all you need. We know if you're an older person and know about communism, that's what communism did. It wiped, wiped out religion, and it said, you have to trust in us now to meet your needs. Trust in what we do to meet your needs. And God says, no, 
not Nebuchadnezzar, not Rome, not Moscow, not Washington, D.C. It's me. It's me. Um, one of, someone reminded me uh, just a, a few weeks ago, and I didn't remember this. I told my wife about it, uh, Betsy, about just yesterday, I think. But I hadn't remembered it was years ago, and someone said, you know, I get off work. One of you said, I get off work, and I, I listen to this talk show all the way home, and by the time I get home, I'm angry. <laughs> and I said, does, you know, does that change the world, that you know this stuff, and now you're angry? No. I said, well, quit listening to that. And uh, what, what you said to me a few, a few weeks back was, and I did quit listening to that, and I quit arriving at home angry. <laughs> um, but, so number one here, number one. Uh, favor and blessing. Favor and blessing. Hope, well-being, and protection in this life and after this life come from being associated, that's your blank, come from being associated with Jesus. This is the message of Luke to Theophilus. Um, your being favored, your blessing, your hope, your well-being in life, your protection in life is not in being good with your Roman government peers and those who are over you like Nero who holds Paul's fate in his hands. And Luke writes to Theophilus and maybe Theophilus will have Nero's ear and Theophilus needs to have some guts here and to say, to Nero, you know, the Christians, they follow Jesus, and here's what Jesus is like. And Theophilus will have all this book, Luke, in front of him to know Jesus' character. But Luke also, or Theophilus also needs to have this assurance that my well-being, if I lose my job as a governor of some kind in the Roman government, I'll be okay. Because Nero doesn't determine my well-being. He doesn't He's not the source of my hope in life or of the life after. Jesus is. Jesus is. So we can see this in verses 42 and 43 and 45. Um, look at verse 42. Blessed is Mary among women. Why? Why does, why does Martha say this? Blessed are you among women. It's because Mary is associated with Jesus. Mary doesn't say that, or sorry, Mary, Martha doesn't say this about Mary before Mary is associated with Jesus, right? It's when Mary comes to Martha, sorry, it's when Martha, no, Mary comes to Martha, and, what are you saying? Elizabeth. Thank you, thank you. Uh, erase all the Marthas into Elizabeth there, great. This happens at home too. Um, so uh, uh, Mary comes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth declares to Mary, with Jesus in her womb, blessed are you among women, because she is the mother of Jesus. Jesus has just come into Mary's presence, and that's why Mary is blessed. How are you blessed in this life and in the life hereafter? Through association with Jesus. Not because Mary had a government over her who was providing for her the things she needed. Neither government, neither Israel's nor, nor Rome's. Blessed are you among women. And blessed are you, at verse 45, at the end here. Blessed are, she, blessed are you because you believe what the Lord said he'll accomplish in you. You believe that he would impregnate you by the Holy Spirit and that you would become... Mother of God. Mary is blessed because of her association with Jesus. And we need to understand that as we operate. Well, I'm not blessed because my neighbors like me. and I want to love my neighbors and be kind to them. But if they hate me because I'm associated with Jesus, I'm okay with that. And I will be okay. If I'm fired, or if my peers don't like me, if, my, if those who are over me don't like me because of my association with Jesus, I'm okay because my hope for eternity doesn't come on their opinion of me. It comes because of my association with Jesus. 
Verse 43, the same thing's true of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is favored because Jesus has come to her. Elizabeth gets this favor and blessing through her association with Jesus being uh, uh, um, as Mary is the mother, or sorry, Elizabeth is the mother of Jesus' prophet. That's who Elizabeth is. She's the mother of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, we didn't read that. It's earlier in chapter 1. John the Baptist would be the one who announces Jesus. And this is why Elizabeth is blessed. She's associated with Jesus and his coming and his coming to earth. And now she's in Jesus' presence. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said he was the good shepherd and he's the shepherd of his sheep. And if you're one of his sheep, he gives you life now that is spiritually abundant. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly, he says in John 10.10. 10. And in John 11.25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Who lives after, who lives on after, after death? Those who believe in him, in Jesus. Our association with Jesus is what brings us blessing in life, abundant life, abundant to our souls. And what brings us blessing after life, resurrection, because we believe in him. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. 1 Peter 1 and 4 that Bob read for us show that being associated with Jesus is what brings this blessing. Uh, in 1 Peter 4 there, you saw that, that even though you will be persecuted or suffer because you bear the name of Jesus on your back, you're blessed. 1 Peter 1, even though you go through grief and various kinds of trial now, you have an inexpressible joy because of your association with Jesus. Number two. Number two. So first of all, favor, blessing, and hope, well-being, and protection come from being associated with Jesus. Number two, to become associated with Jesus and receive the blessing of God, hope, well-being, protection. One must believe. One must believe the message brought by God's Holy Spirit-inspired Messengers, And this is true with several, a couple of people on several levels here. You must believe the message brought by God's Holy Spirit-inspired uh, messengers. Verses 30 through 39, some of that we read this morning, uh, all of it we read uh, last week. Why is Mary blessed? Because Mary heard the message brought by God's Holy Spirit-inspired messenger, Gabriel, the angel, the messenger from heaven. And Mary's blessed, we see there at the, the bottom of this passage, verse 45, blessed is she who has believed. She's blessed because she's believed what this Holy Spirit-inspired messenger has said to her. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said through his angel, through his messenger, will be accomplished. Jesus said clearly in John eleven twenty five, 25, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So there's this aspect here of belief. Um, those who are associated with Jesus, it does, so you're associated with Jesus if you come to church every week. But you have to believe. Believe that what God's messengers say will be accomplished, will be accomplished. And so for us, God's messengers, Holy Scripture, Spirit-inspired Scripture, tells us a final judgment will happen. That will be accomplished. And that Jesus will rescue all those who have believed from that final condemnation. And so blessed are we who believe all that God says will be accomplished. Final judgment, the ridding of earth from all unbelief. And God says to us today, He says to anybody on the earth, here's how you get blessed. Blessed. You believe in what God says will be accomplished. And what will be accomplished? Final judgment and the cleansing of the earth of all unbelief and all who haven't believed. But those who have believed are blessed because the earth is purified for them. 
So we believe the message brought to us by Holy Spirit-inspired messengers. We trust what Scripture says to us, delivered to us by apostles and prophets, carried along by the Holy Spirit, as uh, Peter says in 2 Peter 1.21. Now number three, number three. Those associated, those associated with Jesus by their belief in Him, so reviewing our first two points, those associated with Jesus by their belief in Him get many benefits and blessings as a part of God's as a part of God's favor upon them. Last week we talked about Mary being pronounced upon her a couple of times that God's favor was upon her. So what's a part of this favor is what we're asking here. So A, there, A, those associated with Jesus by their faith in Him get God's Spirit. This is part of God's favor upon us, that those associated with Jesus get God's Spirit. So uh, verse 35 and verse 41 we see this is the case. Verse 35, Mary's favored, and God's Spirit comes upon her. Uh, verse 41, Spirit of God, the Spirit of God comes. Verse 41, look there. Um, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, and Elizabeth, the baby, leaped, that is John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb. The baby, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Those who are favored, those who are favored, get God's Spirit. This doesn't come from ourselves, doesn't come from the people around us, doesn't come from our leaders, our government, our bosses, or whoever. Um, verse 14 of 1 Peter 4, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, if you're associated with Jesus, Peter writes, you are blessed. If you're associated with Jesus and you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Those who endure persecution because Jesus' name is upon them, and they endure that persecution, that means God's spirit's in them. If God's spirit weren't in them, they'd be out. You know, that's rocky soil in Jesus' parable of the soils. And so we have God's spirit because we're associated with Jesus. Uh, B, second uh, part of God's favor that he uh, speaks of here, those associated with Jesus by their faith in him get joy. Joy. Um, look, at verse, uh, look at verse 41 here in this. Verse 41, when uh, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And this is joy that we see that occurs even in John the Baptist here. Uh, joy that occurs even in John the Baptist. In Galatians 5.22, we know that those who have God's Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Love, joy, peace. 1 Peter 1.8 speaks of those who are Christ's. Those who have faith in Christ have this inexplicable joy in them even though they live in an unbelieving world where they are suffering various trials right now. An inexpressible joy that we have within us, even when we're enduring hardship and difficulty. Uh, 1 Peter 4.13, Peter says, okay, so you're suffering for the name of Christ. He says this in verse 13 of chapter 4, Peter, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So there's joy now for us. We say we can rejoice even in suffering because we're associated with Jesus. And then when Jesus comes back, when his glory is revealed, we'll be overjoyed. Number four, number four. So we get as people associated with Jesus, God's Spirit, and we get joy from Him. Um, this is not from human beings. This is not something we can arrange. If it were up to us, well, first of all, we'd fail in organizing our circumstances because we know our lives are full of hardships. It's a losing battle. It's like trying. It's like being in the middle of the ocean and trying to drink the ocean up so that you can stand up. Right? It's just, it's just beyond us. So. So much to do. We can't organize our circumstances for joy. What we can have is in the midst of hardship, have an inexpressible joy in our hearts and souls. 
That hardship won't let up until Jesus comes back. That's our lives. Jesus said in John 16, 33 to his disciples, in this world you will have troubles. That's a promise. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world. In this world, you, you might die for it. You know, the, the writers of Scripture, they knew this. Most of them were martyred, all but John, were martyred, died for their faith, and they knew this, but they knew that their joy didn't come from their circumstances. Their joy didn't come from having the right people above them or society being in order. They knew that their joy came apart from the circumstances apart from the way society was ordered. Uh, will we have great joy when Jesus orders society, when he comes and, and says, okay, you guys have tried for 4,000 years, for 6,000 years, for 12,000 years, and you failed. Every era has failed, right? You, you elect a new person as president, and you find out he doesn't have a mind. You know, or whatever's going on. You know, it's like whoever your, your favorite president they didn't accomplish some things, right, that would have made things better. And they compromised, and they couldn't get things done that they wanted to get things done. You know, if you're a Reaganite, you know, he wanted a balanced budget. Never accomplished, right? Uh, and, and so we have to be honest and realistic and just realize societies for all history have ebbed and, ebbed and flowed. So recognize, number four, recognize that the favor and blessing that you have in life that you have in life and in death are because Jesus came to you. This is a thing of humility for us. Why do I have God's favor now? Why does he give me joy despite my circumstances? Why will his favor shine upon me uh, at final judgment and after? It's because Jesus came to me. Um, you didn't seek out Mary. Okay, put yourself in Elizabeth's shoes. You didn't seek out Mary with Jesus on board. But Mary, with Jesus on board, came to you. Um, someone brought the gospel to you. God brought that in front of your face and in front of your mind that there was a gospel there. And if you didn't know it, you know, if, you were, if your ears were plugged and your eyes closed, so you'd never celebrated Christmas, you didn't know anything about Christianity, and you're here now, it's because God brought the gospel to you. So you sit in Elizabeth's shoes here. I sit in Elizabeth's shoes here. I was just going about my business, going about my day. I went through my, I, I've had stuff in my office from the papers and pictures and stuff that I've saved all through the years. And it's been on my, I got it out a year and a half ago. And it's been on my floor in my office. And, and so yesterday I put it all in boxes organized by great and that kind of thing and I just you know I realized you know what my my life was like you know prior to eighth grade at Christmas time um, 1980 right Bill there we go Bill and I were saved in the same year uh, but how, how things were so different and I read what I wrote and what I was about uh, back then but then God came to me I wasn't looking to I wasn't looking to him uh, but he was coming after me so I brought salvation to my sister. And then she shared that message with me. Um, somebody came to you. Even if it was you being brought into a church all your life, God brought you there and he gave you someone who could proclaim the gospel to you. Or if you learned the gospel from your parents, God brought the gospel, God brought the gospel uh, to you. Jesus arrived. The message that he's God's son and God's eternal favor comes only through him came to you. And God directed that just as it came to Elizabeth through God directing Mary to visit her. Now listen to how Jesus later put it, Luke 19.10, later in the Gospel, Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Who's doing the seeking? It's Jesus. He came to you. God brought the Gospel to you. He brought people in your lives he brought circumstances in your lives so that you'd be open to the gospel. Then he brought his spirit to your life so that you could see it, so that you could hear it, so you could understand it. So we were lost, 
Uh, we read about that in Ephesians 2. Bob read it for us, Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. We were following the prince of the power of the air. We were following Satan. We were walking in the ways of the world. We were doing all kinds of unrighteous things and very happy to be doing so. Or Titus 3, verses 3 and 4. Um, verse 5 gets into, we weren't saved because of the righteous things we were doing or had done, but we were walking in malice and envy and all these things and very content to be doing so and thinking that someday that would work out. <laughs> Even though it kept exploding in our faces. We just couldn't see it was exploding in our faces. Uh, but we were lost, but God sought us out. Uh, and, and note this A in your outline. He doesn't come to everyone. He doesn't. He's not ob obligated to come to anyone. He wasn't obligated to come to you. He wasn't obligated to come to me. He wasn't obligated to come to a single person on earth. He is free as God and creator to create a, a, a um, human race and save nobody. And that would be fair. He's God. He can do anything he wants to do. But God is patient and kind and forgiving. And he has desired to show that off, to display that. Uh, Ephesians 2, 7 puts it this way, that in the ages to come, he might show us the, the riches of his grace and kindness toward us who are in Christ Jesus. And, and so God wasn't obligated. He doesn't come to everyone. Um, and we say, what about the person who's never heard the gospel? We say, they didn't want it. Just like I didn't want it. They didn't deserve to hear the gospel. Just like I didn't deserve to hear the gospel. God owes it to nobody to get the gospel to them. He didn't owe it to you. He didn't owe it to me. He didn't owe it to the person he's never going to get it shared with. But one thing to recognize for you, God brought it to you. Because God the Father chose you before the foundation of the earth. Ephesians 1.4 And so he sent Jesus. And he put your sins in Jesus' body on a cross 2,000 years ago. And then he followed up even further. Not only chose you, not only had Jesus die for your sins so that you had no penalty for sin left to pay, he sent his Holy Spirit to you like he sent it to Mary, like he sent it to Elizabeth, so that you could believe and so realize this. He doesn't come to everyone. Uh, Mary doesn't go on a world tour. She just goes to Elizabeth. Because God has said, even your relative, Elizabeth, she's pregnant now, in her old age. And so Mary hurries off. Hurries off. And God got the gospel to you, just like he got the gospel to Elizabeth. And then B, Recognize God didn't come to you because you were good, because you were good or better or smarter than others. 1 Corinthians 1.21 The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. And you through your wisdom did not come to know Him. Through the world and all our thinking, apart from God coming to people with His message and His Spirit, doesn't figure out God. Doesn't come to know Him. And Elizabeth gets this, verse 43. Look at verse 43 there. She says, but why? Why am I favored? I'm not smarter than anybody. I'm not more important than anybody. I'm not wiser than everybody. I'm not gooder than everybody. She says, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? This should be our recognition in the gospel as Christians. Why did, why did you come to me, God? I wasn't seeking you out, right? Romans 3. No one seeks God. No, not even you. No one seeks God. No, not even one. Not even you who are thinking, well, you came to the gospel, you came to Jesus because you were smarter and more religious and better and God liked you better. Like my friend who was the quarterback at New York, New York Ohio High School right, that I told you about last week. 
So number one, God's favor through association with Jesus comes to those who are in humble circumstances. Uh, we talked about that. That was last week's sermon, verses 5 through 25, Mary's humbleness. Uh, verse 36, and then verse 40 with, with Elizabeth. Uh, but verse 36, how is Elizabeth in humble circumstances? She was old and barren, verse 36. Old and without a child. And she and her husband Zechariah wanted to have a child. And in those days, in contrast somewhat to our days, it was a, a, a thing of great humility in a bad sense. You were humble uh, if you were a woman in old age and had never had kids. Um, your glory, as, as Solomon says in the Proverbs, you know, a, a parent's glory is through sons who are righteous, kids who are righteous and follow the Lord. And, and, and so, you know, Mary's in this place where she's, you know, abandoned by God in her old age, no kids. Um, but God comes to her in her humble circumstances. And this is God's pattern as we talked to talked about last week. Um, often these hum- circumstances of those God brings the gospel to, often they're physical and material circumstances that are humble. But also, and in every case, number two, in every case, this speaks of humble circumstances spiritually. It's the case for everyone who comes to faith in Jesus that they were in humble circumstances spiritually. Theophilus was to realize this. Even though he was on top of the world in terms of position and power and prestige in his day, his circumstances spiritually were circumstances of humility. Um, he had not sought God, Romans 3, 9-17. through 17. Um, he was involved in a world and operating and maneuvering and lying and, and, and uh, um, a slander and such from Titus 3 or Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. And so Luke communicates to Theophilus here, Theophilus, this was the case for you as well. You, though you were not in humble circumstances uh, physically, in terms of societal power structures, you were in humble circumstances spiritually. Who you were, you were, you were humble. You were in humble circumstances. And this is the case for us. But what did we have to speak for us before God? A lot of sin. Okay, and so that just brings us humility. So number five, lastly, lastly, uh, Mary and Elizabeth show us two things, two things Christians are to do. So we're to be people who recognize that favor and blessing uh, come to us by association with Jesus, that God determines favor and blessing and, and hope. He's the one who brings that. Um, that God doesn't bring it to everybody. But he brought it to you, so be grateful and be humble about that. And then, lastly, number five, two things Christians are to do. A, first thing you're to do. Um, you're to have your life be filled with action, action after action that flows from your belief. Action after action that flows from your belief. Mary hurries off. We saw Mary hurries off to see Elizabeth, believing what God's messenger Gabriel had told her about Elizabeth. So, verse 39, look there. At that time, now, Mary had just been told, verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own age. And he who is, she who is said to be barren is now in her sixth month of pregnancy. And so, verse 39, Mary, Mary believes. Her actions are affected by what she's been told by this spirit-inspired messenger, Gabriel. And so what she do about this knowledge that she has now, this spirit-inspired message, which is what scripture is for us, spirit-inspired message, she takes action. She leaves Nazareth pretty far in the north, up by the Sea of Galilee, but, but uh, west of it. And she goes clear down into Judea, and she visits her, her relative, Elizabeth. She hurries off right away, uh, she goes. She believes. Verse 45, how does Elizabeth say this message to her? Blessed are you who believed. Because Mary did believe. Because Mary 
had baby Jesus in her now, and Mary had gone off to see Elizabeth because Elizabeth had had been told. So Mary had been told that Elizabeth was now was now pregnant. So you know, Theophilus, Theophilus had action before him too. He wasn't surrounded by a Jewish community. wasn't surrounded by a Christian community except on Sundays when he when he went to the church there in Rome. But his work week was among non-believers. Sound familiar? Anybody? His neighbors were non-believers. And that sounds familiar to us too. His relatives were non-believers most likely. With a name like Theophilus, coming from a Roman Greek background. But his faith was not to be silent. His faith was not to have no effect. In fact, it's likely that his faith, his actions, his words could spring Paul out of prison there in Rome. As Paul sat there, as Luke wrote this gospel and handed it to Theophilus there in Rome. And maybe Theophilus could speak up for Paul. And maybe Theophilus could communicate Here's what Paul is preaching. Here's the Jesus that Paul is preaching. These people are obeying the government. These people are are bringing good news. These people are telling their followers that the Romans aren't the enemy. And Luke shows through his gospel that Jesus is showing the Jews this. Rome is not your enemy. And I receive anyone to me who comes to me. These folks are friends with everybody. These folks are commanded to be at peace with everyone as far as it's up to them. Theophilus' message to Nero should be, we should have more Christians in our society, not less. Because they're the ones who understand authorities. They're the ones, Romans 13, which has been written prior to the Gospel of Luke. Romans 13, who pay their taxes who give to whom it is due, even though we're persecuting them. They're paying their taxes. They recognize that we're their authorities. They believe that God has placed us over them. That's what Paul declares in Romans 13. Every authority given among men has been placed there by God, whether they're persecuting you to death or whether they're promoting the Christian faith. God is sovereign even over those who have Paul in prison. And Christians are treating us as the Roman government better than our own Gentile Roman citizens do. But Theophilus was to take action. He was to communicate this message to those around him who weren't believers. Even if it cost him his life or his position. So have your life be filled with action after action that flows from your belief. Have your belief be affected by this. Secondly, what we do, by the Spirit within us, by the Spirit within us, we proclaim, we proclaim the twofold truth about Jesus. Why is Theophilus given all this information, this long gospel with long chapters? It didn't have chapters back when it was given. Uh, but why this long message about Jesus to Theophilus? so he would know what to proclaim. And what do we see here in this passage that's there about Jesus to proclaim? Two things, two things. Number one, in your outline there, number one, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the Lord. Jesus is the Son of God and that he's the Lord. Verse 35, one of the outflows of Mary being uh, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and as a virgin, having conception in her womb and giving birth to a child, is that this child would be, verse 35, he'd be the Son of God. Almighty God. That's Christian belief. Jesus is the Son of God, the Lord. Elizabeth acknowledges this in verse 43. Notice what she says there in verse 43. Look down there. Verse 43. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Theophilus understand this. Jesus is God. Christians, we understand this. Jesus is God. If I write you an email, well, I do all of you. You know, underneath it, basic message of the gospel. Jesus is God, and he forgives the sins of all who come to him. 
That's the basic message of the gospel. Jesus is God, therefore he rightly judge over you, but he will forgive you if you come to him before you reach that time of judgment. And so that's the first part of this twofold message. Jesus is the Son of God and the Lord. Gabriel proclaims this to, uh, to Mary, and Elizabeth understands uh, this, verse 43. And then the other part of this message to proclaim, that one's well-being and blessing in life and afterlife are not through our maneuvering or our lying or our finding the perfect spouse or the perfect coach or the perfect boss or the perfect company to work for or the perfect kids or the perfect neighbors or the perfect neighborhood or the perfect house. You ever know some of those people who move from house to house to house, town to town to town, you know, and, and a lot of those uh, uh, buy it or, what's that show, buy it or sell it or love it or list it. <laughs> buy it or sell it um, love it or you know those, those houses or or the you know and I love watching those shows where they just have a budget and they've got like seventy thousand dollars to change their kitchen wow I'd love to have seventy thousand dollars here's your budget for the kitchen you know since you bought the crapo house you've got two hundred thousand dollars left over right talk about first world problems <laughs> Uh, but there's this thought, if we have this household, this will just be perfect. And you see the hopes of those people, thinking if I get in just the right house, then my well-being will be established. Um, but our message is your well-being will to be established by the new house, by the new job, by just the right spouse, or by a different spouse. That's all. Those are all lies of the world. Um, but it's through, guess who? Jesus. There we go. One's well-being, second part of the gospel. We say to people, Jesus is God, and your well-being now and in eternity is by him. The end. That's the gospel. And we tend to emphasize the end part because we know we're going to suffer. And so that well-being part is hard to explain because it's a well-being soul, and they don't care about that yet because they're a non-believer. Right? Um, so we see that in verse 43, 42, 45, John 10, 10, Acts 4, 12. Uh, we proclaim this as Elizabeth did in verses 41 and 42, uh, as we're told in Luke 24, 46, Peter, uh, 1 Peter uh, 3, 15. We're proclaimers of this, of this message. Um, Theophilus was to realize a number of things that he'd read in this text from Luke. That well-being comes from being associated with Jesus. Um, Good things for you and your life come from being associated with Jesus. Good things in eternal life come from uh, being associated uh, with with Jesus. Um, Well-being um, does not come from a divine Caesar. Come from heaven, Son of God, who blesses people. We talked about that a little bit last week. That's what Romans believed about their Caesar. That Caesar had come from heaven. Um, and that he was there to bless the people. And uh, certain Caesars took this upon themselves more than others did. Nero and, and Domitian in the 90s were two Caesars that took this upon themselves. And they said this Roman myth that uh, Caesar is God, come from heaven, come to bless the people, now bow down and worship me. Um, you know, that's, that's promoted by politicians from all, all the eras, right? Um, I'm from heaven. That was common in the ancient world. It's common in Rome. And without saying it, it's common in our day too. Vote for me and I'll provide for your every need. Everything will be good in your life if you vote for me. You know, and the incumbent gets blamed for everything not being okay. And the challenger says, well, if I were there, I would have done what he didn't do. <laughs> How easy is that to say, right? Um, I would have perceived that. Uh, but Jesus is the Son of God, and he has come from heaven to bless his people. What Luke does, Mark does this too, as Mark wrote, writes to a Roman, Roman audience, is that this Roman myth of Caesar, come from heaven to bless his people, now bow down and worship him and things will be good for you. Government is the solution. This is true of Jesus. And that Roman myth of Caesar is counterfeit, and it'll break your it'll break your heart. 
And, and so we as Christians get relieved from this. We get relieved from this cycle of, of anger. It's, the, it's the, the talk radio cycle. Anger, hope, and crushed. Anger, hope, and crushed. We get relieved from that because we're not expecting that from this world. But we're expecting it from Jesus. He is divine Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Son of Almighty Creator, who comes to bless His people. So for Theophilus and for us who believed, it means a changed life. Actions that spring from this belief, including standing up before our peers and higher authorities to proclaim what we know to be true, that Jesus is God. Joy would come from this and not from the potential continued approval of co-fellow workers and authorities, um, and friends and relatives around us. So we're to realize and act upon this message about Jesus as well. And that's this. Here's your conclusion, just summarizing all this for us. By association with Jesus through believing, by association with Jesus through believing the message that Jesus is God's Son, that Jesus is God's Son, and that true True well-being is through him. By association with Jesus, through belief in this message, that Jesus is God's son, and that well-being comes from him. Uh, you and every, anyone else can have God's favor, can have God's favor and blessing now and in eternity, eternally. Um, your actions, your actions now are always your actions now are always to be affected by your belief in the message. Our actions are always to be affected by this belief in the message. And this message we are to proclaim. We're to proclaim to others. This message we're to proclaim to others. Let's pray.